get the show under on the road. Hello, everyone. Um, can I welcome you all to uh, the first of our, our two-part uh, event on Australia's energy future. Thanks very much for joining us all this evening. My name's uh, Christian Camilleri, and I'll be hosting, at least I'll be the, the face, uh, the front face of this event um, on behalf of uh, the organisation I'm associated with, Conversation at the Crossroads, and perhaps we'll say a couple of words about that right at the end of uh, tonight's event. Uh, just to let everybody know who's joining us this evening, we are recording the session. Um, so anyone who doesn't wish to appear, please feel free to turn your cameras off. But we would ask that you keep your mics on mute while our speakers have the floor. Um, and But that in keeping with good Zoom etiquette, that you leave your cameras on, it's much nicer speaking to faces than to blank screens. Uh, unless, of course, you're experiencing some sort of difficulties with bandwidth or are you not in a suitable in environment to have your camera on. So before going any further, let me um, acknowledge the Wurundjeri people, the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm speaking to you from today. And let me also acknowledge the tr traditional custodians of lands from wherever you might be joining us in Australia this evening. I pay my respects to elders past and present, and I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here tonight. And I acknowledge that sovereignty has never been ceded. So let me make a few brief remarks about what tonight's all about, and then I'll get on to introduce our speakers. And from the outset, tonight is the first of a two point is the information session will be followed in a week's time by our strategy session. So we're hoping that tonight will uh, help um, us all become better informed about the current state of play in Australia with regard to energy policy and um, what steps are being actively or perhaps not as actively taken to move towards um, the, the targets we all hate, hope we will achieve towards a far more re sustainable renewable energy sector. Um, and a better, we, we also, we're looking um, to generate a better understanding of the obstacles, whether they be political or economic, technological, or even cultural, maybe even behavioral that stand in the way of bringing about a shift to a greater reliance on renewables, but also perhaps even if we have time for it, the way we as people consume energy. Um, so we're hoping this might inspire some thoughts on what we as individuals and perhaps collectively might do to overcome some of those obstacles. And so the idea is that we brought in two very knowledgeable experts tonight to speak to us so we'll be carefully taking note of what they say. There'll be plenty of time for questions and, and answers and discussion. But we ask that you absorb as, much, as best as you can what's been said, reflect on what you've learned and go away and think about it and come back next week where we're going to have, we're going to workshop a few ideas based on what we've learned and have a, um, a strategy session involving small group discussion. So that will be as advertised on Thursday, the 7th of October, this time next week. And there our aim will be formulating a more achievable set of goals and strategies based on the sorts of things we've heard tonight. So for this evening, I'm in the moment I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Mark Wakem, who's going to talk to us for about 20 minutes or so. And following that, I'm going to introduce uh, Tony Wood, who will speak for his allotted 20 minutes plus or minus. And then we'll take questions from the floor. And I'd like to invoke the, the raised hand function, which you will find under reactions in the little bottom menu you have. So if you go to reactions, you'll find a little raised hand function, and then we'll just be able to scan through the list and pick out those if you have questions. If you're desperate to get your thoughts down um, and not so you won't forget them as they occur to you during the talks, please perhaps drop them down in chat. We have a few people who'll be monitoring the chat. Um, and if, if, they're, if they're missed in my initial take, they'll be brought to my attention. I might even pose the odd question and use uh, my chair's prerogative to, to Tony and Mark. And I may even get you to read each other's comments. So without any further ado, let me introduce the first of our two speakers for this evening, Mark Wakem. 
So Mark has worked, uh, Mark Wakem's worked in leadership positions for Australian environmental NGOs over almost two decades. He is um, currently the Senior Advisor for Climate, Energy and Just Transitions at the Australian Council of Trade Unions and is a current board member of Sustainability Victoria. He's a former CEO of Environment Victoria, was also previously served as a campaign director, and he was an energy campaigner for Greenpeace Australia Pacific for three years, and during that time helped build a movement of Australians wanting climate change action and successfully worked for the introduction of renewable energy and energy efficiency targets in Victoria, New South Wales, and nationally. He was the coordinator of the Environment Centre of the Northern Territory for five years and was a lecturer at Northern Territory University and actually a radio operator in the army at some stage. And he holds a BA in history, uh, degrees in commerce and a graduate diploma in adult education. And recently, just last year, was awarded the prestigious Churchill Fellowship. So um, that's a very, um, a, a very amazing um, a record there in, in the space that we're talking about today. So I'll hand the floor over to Mark. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Christian. Um, you must have got the long bio. I should have given you the short one. Um, <laughs> thanks very much, everyone. Nice to see you all. Um, I'm on Wurundjeri land tonight in Melbourne and pay respects to um, elders past, present and emerging. And um, I also want to just extend my solidarity to you all wherever you are around Victoria or Australia. Um, it's been a pretty tough 18 months and some people have had, found it particularly tough. So I hope you're traveling okay. Um, I'm gonna share a um, presentation with you. Um, so as Chris Jones said, I'm, I'm working with the Australian Council of Trade Unions, which is the national peak uh, body with, with all the different unions as members of the Australian Council of Trade Unions. So I'm going to be giving a bit of a perspective from our members, which includes um, the unions who are really active in the energy sector, like the you know the the mining unions, the electricians, um, the the um, unions who do the, and the workers who do the maintenance on the power stations and who are building new renewable energy power stations. But it also includes you know the nurses, the teachers, the lecturers, um, you know. ACTU represents all the different perspectives across the union movement. And my job is to help them build ambition um, on climate change and for a just transition. So it's just starting, this slide is um, Australia's climate history over the last 150 years. It's an artwork called um, Warming Stripes. And the blue years are cooler than average and the red years are warmer than average. Um, and we're moving from about 1850 on the left through to the present day on the right and you can see um, that nearly all the years have been significantly warmer than average in recent times. So um, I'm, I'm gonna to talk to you about Australia's energy transition. I'm gonna start by looking at what's driving the energy transition. Um, what is a just transition, which is a, um, a concept I'll introduce shortly. I'm gonna talk about ensuring jobs in renewable energy are good jobs and ensuring that Australia doesn't get left behind as the world gets serious about tackling climate change. So what's driving the energy transition? Um, I'm gonna argue that there's, there's four key drivers, climate science and policy responses, the age of existing energy infrastructure in Australia, the economics of new energy technologies in Australia, but also globally, and trends in global uh, finance. So just to walk through them, um, I'm getting a glitch here. Oh. So, um, Sorry, I got a gremlin in my presentation. So climate change and climate science is driving and accelerating energy transition. These are photos all taken in Australia in recent times showing the escalating impacts of climate change that we're living with now. It's not some future issue. Um, Australia's uh, temperature on land has already increased by um, an average um, of uh, uh, 1.5 degrees um, over the last 100 years. So we're already so um, we're already experiencing significant um, global warming that's baked into the system, unfortunately. And you know the global goal of um, limiting global warming to 1.5 to less than two degrees, and and hopefully 1.5 degrees 
is um, very difficult to achieve given current trajectories. And you know, you, know, you might think that 1.5 degrees doesn't sound too dramatic, but with an increase in temperature of 1.5 degrees comes much more significant and, and exacerbated extremes, um, which lead to these extreme weather events that are so damaging. So the world is responding. We're, we're moving very slowly, but we are responding. Um, uh, I, I mentioned that the, the window for limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees is fast closing. This, this thermometer on the left shows um, where we're at. It, it communicates several things. It shows that globally, we're at 1.2 degrees warming. That's the average across land and sea um, as of last year. Um, we've got um, some future temperature rise baked in as a result of historic emissions. And then um, based on the current policies of countries around the world, we're looking at roughly three degrees. If we take the country's pledges and targets on climate change at, at you know, we assume that they implement those targets, we're looking at about 1.5, uh, sorry, 2.4 degrees Celsius. And if we're optimistic, if we give countries where there's any doubt about their climate policy, the benefit of the doubt, we're looking at about two degrees of global warming. Now, that sounds really dramatic and, and, and depressing. Um, but I've been showing this slide for a few years now, and actually um, it, it's the um, temperature increase that we're looking at based on the world's emissions is actually lowering over time as countries increase their ambition. And so we've had some really significant escalation of um, national climate targets over the past 18 months. So you can see here, and you can see how it stacks up against Australia, if we look at just the 2005 graph on the left, um, Britain promising to reduce emissions by 63 percent by 2030, um, US 52 percent by 2030, European Union 51 percent, Canada 45 percent, Japan 44 percent. They're all ta new targets in the last 12 months, those increased commitments, and you can see that Australia is really falling behind. So Climate science is one of the significant drivers um, for Australia's energy transition. The second, I mentioned that many of Australia's existing power stations um, are aging, really rapidly approaching the end of their life or actually beyond the end of their technical life, although they've been you know, maintained and serviced along the way to keep them going for a little bit longer. This is Hazelwood, which was closed just four years ago. Um, was, they started construction of that power station in, um, I think it was 1960. Um, uh, and it was running until 2017, so 50, over 50 years. Um, and if you look at the fleet of coal-fired power stations in our national electricity market, um, you can see that, um, sorry, that um, many of them are approaching uh, 50 years of age um, very soon. So, um, the, 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 uh, the many of these power stations have actually closed already, but many are scheduled to close over the next decade or two. And in some cases, they're really struggling to continue to be reliable. Um, and that's, we've seen a massive increase in um, outages and breakdowns at coal-fired power stations in the national electricity market in recent times, which again is hastening the energy transition. Um, the economics of power generation have changed dramatically. And, um, you know, I've been in this game for a while, as is Tony, who you'll hear from in a moment. I remember sitting with him talking about solar panels in about um, 2006 or 2007 in, in Adelaide. Um, and the price of, and the, the output from solar panels in that time has they've just dramatically improved and come down in price. If you look at, um, Wind turbines, you can see here that the average size and output has grown dramatically over the last three decades. Um, so by a factor of a, a hundred there. This is the same story in, in solar generation. The, the orange is the price of a solar panel per watt over the last three decades. And on the right is the, the amount of installed solar power. So you can see as the price has fallen, um, quite dramatically, um, installations have increased. 
And this tells a similar story. This is looking at the global power fleet and shows that in uh, 2020, uh, actually, I'm just going to, yeah, in 2020, 83% um, of new additions in terms of capacity to electricity generation all over the planet, 83% um, of additions were renewable um, and just the, the remaining 17% were fossil fuels. So that's, you know, you often hear people in Australia talking about, you know, the, the investment in other countries in coal and gas, but the global story actually is that renewables are, are winning now. And that's because renewables are the cheapest form of power generation. Um, so this um, is work that was, that's been um, compiled by um, the CSIRO and the Australian Energy Market Operator. And it, it shows um, various estimates of the cost of generation of different technologies. And you can see um, gas open cycle is, was the cheapest, although gas prices have increased quite dramatically. And now rooftop PV, large scale solar PV and wind are the cheapest. Um, and, you know, that's a complicated story as well, because as we get more of these new technologies, um, particularly if they're variable technologies, they're not dispatching power the whole time, you do need investment in storage um, and, and strengthening the system as well. Just another another indication of um, you know what's been happening in different energy technology prices over the years, and um, you can just see the dramatic falling cost in solar solar photovoltaic um, over the last decade. And you know you often hear people talking up nuclear power and why aren't we doing more about nuclear power to solve climate change? Um, and you can have a whole lot of reasons for objecting to nuclear power, but uh, just on price alone, um, it would be very expensive thing to pursue in Australia. And so finally, um, finance, um, uh, the finance industry and business is moving quite dramatically. We're seeing uh, large investors align their emissions targets with what the science requires. So many businesses have adopted net zero emissions targets um, for 2050 or earlier. Many have near-term emissions reductions targets, and many of them have made large um, renewable energy commitments as well, you, to, the, to the point where you now have um, solar powered coal mines in Queensland, if that makes any sense to you. It's a strange concept. Uh, so question you can answer in the chat. Um, the Australia's energy transition has been happening incredibly fast. I just ask you to um, submit your answers in the chat as to how many you think have closed in the past eight years. I'll come back to that question. So this, this energy transition has been happening extremely fast. It's not a future thing. Um, I can't see if I'm getting answers in the chat. <laughs> anyway, I'll keep moving. It's 12 coal-fired power stations have closed in the last eight years. Um, so it's, this is not a future thing, it's happening very quickly. And a, a really um, disappointing part of that energy transition is that the average notice period for workers when coal-fired power stations was four months. That is from the moment that the power station announced that they were closing to when they actually closed was around 120 days, which obviously is not enough time for workers to plan what the rest of their life looks like, their working life looks like. It's not enough time for those communities that host those power stations to diversify their regional economies. It's not enough time for workers to undertake retraining, et cetera. Um, we do know, uh, we, we now have a little more notice. So new rules have been introduced that require generators to give three and a half years notice of closure. And we know that the next power stations to close at Liddell in New South Wales, Moojasi in Western Australia, Yalorn in Victoria, um, Torrance Island, um, which is a gas-fired power station in um, South Australia, which is closing, there is now a bit more advanced planning, which will hopefully deliver some better results. When I'm looking at this from a worker perspective, you know, workers are, have been losing these well-paid, secure jobs in these power stations. Um, and often what they've been um, replaced with is less secure, less organized and well-paid jobs in the renewable energy sector. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, 
we're increasingly seeing that we need to invest a lot in upgrading our national electricity um, transmission networks and, and, to, and in building more storage. And there's some real challenges in this. Um, you know, big power lines through regional areas are not always welcomed, but we actually need to build them quite quickly if we want to decarbonize at the, at the scale that's needed. So there's some real, real challenges in that. And finally, we have no coherent national energy or climate policy or a plan around a just transition. And I'll talk more about that in a second. So just transitions, um, this is a concept that was developed by trade unions um, uh, a couple of decades ago. And it, it's become a little bit toxic in the Australian energy conversation because it's been weaponized by, you know, people like Matt Canavan and George Christensen who've talked about a just transition, essentially putting people out of work. But it's embedded in the Paris Agreement. It's a really important commitment which recognises that no communities should be um, unnecessarily burdened or sh should have to, sh to shoulder a disproportionate burden of the costs of decarbonising our economy. That you know, workers and communities cannot be left behind in that process. And globally, 46 governments have committed to developing a national plan for a just transition. And when they go to the conference of parties in Glasgow, not only will they be submitting their emissions targets, they'll also be submitting their national just transition plans. And in countries like Germany, for instance, um, the German um, hard coal industry has been phased out. 190,000 people um, were employed in that industry two decades ago. And yet that has been completely phased out without a single forced redundancy. And it was done through planning um, that was done between government, unions, business, researchers, local government. And that's something we've absolutely lacked in Australia, which has made our energy transition a lot more painful than it um, needs to be. And so this concept of a just transition is often talked about in relation to the energy sector, but increasingly it's going to be relevant to other sectors. So in agriculture, for instance, places in Australia, some parts of Australia will be unviable for agriculture. And we need to be asking hard questions about what we're going to be doing to support workers and those communities um, as, um, you know, running a dairy processing facility, for instance, is no longer viable. What, this energy transition is only going to accelerate. This graph just shows um, what's happened in the national electricity market over the last seven or eight years. The, the um, black and brown or grey um, chunks below the line are power stations closing, leaving the system. And the yellow and green are new power stations entering the system. So you can see it's happening incredibly quickly. The renewable energy sector has grown from a very small industry 15, 20 years ago to now employing 27,000 Australians. But they're a very different type of job. Most of the jobs are upfront in the construction of these projects. Um, a solar farm, for instance, um, most workers who are employed to build a solar farm will only be on site for eight weeks. And so you can imagine um, <clears throat> that creates some challenges around the security of those jobs. Um, a lot, often they're quite poorly paid. Often there's not very good working conditions. There's often some safety issues as well. Um, or too often there's been safety issues. So um, this is a real challenge that unions are grappling with and that we need some more national planning and coordination around. And so some of the things that we'd like to see is that um, when power stations close, that there's no forced redundancies for power stations, um, for, 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 um, for power station workers, that they are given opportunities to be redeployed to other power stations. Um, lengthy notice some periods I mentioned, comprehensive uh, mine and power station rehabilitation plans. You know, these mines that in some cases we've been mining for 70, 80 years, the Hazelwood pit was mined for, you know, it's been mined for years, the Yalorn pit um, since the early 1900s has been mining of one sort or another there. 
Um, there's potentially, you know, 20 years of work there for um, mine workers who are losing their jobs in rehabilitating those sites and ensuring that the community is left with um, something that's of value rather than just a hole in the ground um, surrounded by a fence. We need investment in um, supporting workers to retrain. We need investment in diversifying regional economies of coal regions, and that doesn't happen overnight. It requires you know, leadership and, and investment over time by government. And, and you know, it's not just about supporting the coal power station workers in places like the Latrobe Valley or the Hunter Valley, Valley or Central Queensland. Often, you know, we've got these very highly paid fossil fuel workers, but then the second income earner in a family might be working at the childcare centre or at the local kindergarten or, you know, aged care centre. And often we're really not valuing their work very well in terms of the, their, their pay, their security, et cetera. So there's a, there's a complex picture to think about. And finally, just ensuring that new clean energy jobs actually deliver on the promise of being good jobs. Um, just on this, I just want to, don't want to labor this point too much, but um, basically the, the renewable energy industry is going to grow pretty dramatically over the next couple of uh, decades. Um, the estimates are that um, by uh, 20, 2030, um, we'll have grown the, the renewable energy industry from 27,000 jobs to about 45,000 jobs. So that's a really big opportunity. But as I mentioned, a lot of them have been in construction um, and often they've been very short-term contracts and they haven't been particularly well-paid or had training pathways, et cetera. One of the reasons for that, I would argue, is that <coughs> that's going to change is that most renewables that have been built in Australia at the moment have been driven there through renewable energy targets, which have encouraged project developers to build their projects quickly um, and to compete against others to, to build for the lowest possible price, basically. But the new driver for renewable energy projects are often um, corporate power purchase agreements or so a company like Coles or Aldi that decides that they want to power their business with renewable energy. And they're doing so because they want a good news story. And so I, I think increasingly that's going to um, mean that they're going to start looking at um, you know, other aspects of those renewable energy projects and making sure that good work is being created and that communities that are host to these projects um, are being strengthened because there's secure jobs, because there's training for young workers, because there's employment of traditional owners on site, et cetera. So we've, we've set out a bit of an agenda of what we'd like to see the renewable energy industry deliver. And we're having a, a pretty good dialogue with them about doing just that. So final few comments. Um, more broadly, beyond just the energy transition, we really risk, risk being left behind, not just because of the impacts of climate change, but if we don't get on board, the clear signal that the world is sending us that they want um, clean uh, products and services into the future. This slide shows two things. The, on the left, it shows our largest trading partners. And the trading partners with a tick beside them are countries that have made net zero um, emissions commitments. So 83% um, of our exports go to countries that have made net zero emissions commitments by 2050, or in the case of China, by 2060. <clears throat> so basically all of those countries, our largest trading partners are saying, we want zero emissions goods and services. The graph on the right shows what our 10 largest exports are. And they're either incredibly, they're either um, uh, carbon intensive, um, like the fossil fuels, coal, natural gas, um, or they're emissions intensive products like um, aluminium ores and concentrates or iron ore, which is an input into a polluting process, which is steel making polluting at the moment, um, hopefully will not be in the future. So we're in a very vulnerable place. Our biggest exports are going to countries that don't want dirty exports. So we need to very quickly develop new um, zero carbon exports and industries. And the good news is we have really big opportunities in that. We're ridiculously lucky to be blessed, not just with these fossil fuel resources that have made a lot of money for the country and created many jobs over many years, but we have among the best renewable energy resources in the world. And we could be the world's um, providers of products like steel, 
a green steel, green aluminium, hydrogen that's been made with renewable energy, um, and some of the critical minerals that are going to batteries that are going to power the electric vehicle fleet, etc. So we've got a real opportunity, which could come with a lot of jobs, um, but you actually need to develop climate policy, energy policy, industry policy to reap those benefits. And we've really lacked that federal leadership with a, you know, given that we've been in the climate wars for so long here. So I guess my final message to you is that we can be part of the solution or just get left behind. And um, we have this big opportunity. This is a photo of wind turbine towers being manufactured in Western Victoria at Keppel Prince factory where about 150 workers are building those towers. Um, we can be building clean energy economy jobs that will help us um, thrive in a global economy, but also help provide the necessary and, and rapid solutions that we urgently need to solve global warming. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Sorry, I was on mute. Thanks very much, Mark. That was great. Um, could we all somehow show our appreciation, whether it's by reaction or a, a little uh, clap? Thank you. Now, I know people will have um, questions and they, they have started coming. Mark, I should point out that when you looked at the chat, we, we had a slight glitch and that was preventing people. It wasn't you, it was us, but we have rectified that and, and the questions are coming in. And that was the only reason people didn't um, answer your question. I think we were all underestimating too, if that's what you were guessing with the number of closure, closures. Um, so look, I know people will be thinking questions, but the, the, pro, the plan is to move on to Tony Wood, um, who I'll introduce in just a moment, and then we'll open the floor to everybody to perhaps ask some questions of both speakers, and, um, um, and that's how we'll go. So uh, thanks very much, Mark. We'll, we'll, we'll get you to hang on, and I'll now um, introduce uh, Tony Wood. Um, since 2011, uh, Tony Wood's been the Ed Energy Program Director at the Grattan Institute and he, during that time he's written numerous articles, more than 30 for the conversation that relate to energy, climate change and energy, energy policy and he's appeared in various radio um, and public forums. Um, between 2002 and 2008 he was the Executive General Manager of Origin Energy where he held executive positions um, and um, Tony's also worked in the energy, trans chemical and fertilizer industries. He contributed to the Garneau Climate Change Review and examined the impacts of climate change on the Australian economy and recommended medium to long-term policies and policy frameworks to improve the prospects for sustainable prosperity. And in fact, between uh, 2009 and 2014, worked with the Clinton Foundation as a director of its clean energy program. And he was on the executive board of the Committee for Melbourne and the Green Energy Task Force of the Northern Territory Government. So a lot of credentials there too. So without any further ado, I'll pass, um, pass it over to you, uh, Tony. Thank you. Okay, look, thank you, Kristen, and um, to your organisation for arranging this this evening. Um, you'll find some of there will be some common elements, not surprisingly, between what Mark said and what I'm going to say. I'm going to take a slightly different pathway through and then, as I said, connect on a few points. Um, what I'm going to do is anchor this, this part of my uh, this conversation about on this concept, which seems to have infiltrated our language around climate change and energy policy in terms of net zero. Talk a little bit about what that means for a transition to a different sort of energy future what are the key obstacles and what might be the opportunities? And again, as I said, there'll be some overlap in what I'll say from what um, uh, Mark said. I find it interesting that um, very few people seem to have thought about what net zero is and even for where the hell this thing came from, because it wasn't that long ago that we didn't ever talk about net zero energy. We talked emissions, we talked about certain targets, we talked about certain temperatures, but more recently, this concept of net zero has emerged, and now it almost seems the only thing people can talk about. Um, it dominates the political landscape in Australia and will dominate the political landscape in Glasgow in a, few, in a few weeks' time. But at the most simple level, net zero means we're going to try and go back to where we used to be. 
And that was a world in which the greenhouse gas emissions from humans and animals were offset by greenhouse gas absorptions by plants and oceans. And the world was in balance for a long, long time and created a stable climate. But in the very recent times on comparatively, um, and this compares with that chart that Mark showed you of the, of the blue and red stripes, um, what we've seen is the whole thing has been put out of balance. So the objective, the very simple objective is to get back to zero. And that means where every tonne of greenhouse gases that goes into the atmosphere is directly and simply offset by one tonne of greenhouse gases that comes out of the atmosphere. It's not about reducing emissions. It's fundamentally about getting to net zero. And unless you're at net zero, global warming will continue. Uh, it's a point being made by very clearly if anyone's read Bill Gates' book. Now, the reason it's important is because when we think about the things that have to change to get to a net zero world, the first part is relatively easy and yet we still seem to find it quite difficult. It's the last bits where things get a bit more interesting. We don't yet know enough about how we're gonna do the last bits. So what we tend to do is use the last bits, the most difficult things, as an excuse not to do the first bits, the easier things. And it's very easy to paint, oh my God, what's gonna happen if we have, you know, 100% renewables? And what happens if we have a period of time at night time when the wind stops blowing and oh my God, yeah, that will not be the problem. So I'm gonna just talk a little bit about what has to change and what, as I said, the obstacles and opportunities really are. Firstly, as Mark pointed out, um, within the next few decades, we will stop burning coal and gas and we'll replace them with basically wind and solar energy. And they'll be supported by other things, maybe hydrogen partly. In the case of electricity, there may still be a role for gas with offsets for a period of time as we sort out the last few percentages. We will see the electrification of transport um, it's relatively easy and in most cases um, will be cheaper than what we do today. It's already cheaper to run an electric car. It'll be soon cheaper to buy one. Um, heavy vehicles will take a bit longer. The, one of the significant contributors to our emissions, which isn't talked about very much, is industrial emissions. Um, it's not as, in, most people don't even think about it. But when you, think, when you actually think about all those businesses who make things, foundries, uh, brickworks, um, pizza parlors, uh, dry cleaners. A lot of them use gas for their energy. Some of them use gas as a feedstock as well. And replacing that is a little more difficult. Sometimes it requires the changeover of capital equipment. And right now that's an expensive thing to do. Uh, once you get to the other side, it turns out as Mark pointed out, things get a lot easier. But there are some obstacles in the case of industrial emissions. While electricity is about a third of our emissions in Australia, stationary energy associated with industrial emissions is also about a third. The difference is that the electricity side is moving, as Mark described, with renewable energy replacing coal. The industrial emissions are not moving much at all. So we need to think about that a lot more. If you look at transport emissions before, transport emissions are not going down, they're forecast to go up. And they're about 20% of our emissions. They went down a little bit during COVID, as you'd expect, but they're forecast to go up again. And then 15% of our emissions come from agriculture, about 75 million tonnes a year. The biggest single source of emissions in agriculture is belching cows and sheep. And that's a tricky one because there, it, there are implications if we're going to um, get those emissions as part of a net zero objective. Remember, all of this is energy. <laughs> Basically, everything I've talked about is energy in some shape or form. And what we're, what we're going to see fundamentally is an integration of the energy system, particularly around electricity. And even in the, even in the agricultural sector, there will be areas which are associated with electricity, and not all of them. Um, but agriculture, on the one hand, looks to be a pretty tricky one. But on the other hand, it's interesting that Almost as we are speaking, the agricultural sector is adopting net zero targets itself. So the Meat and Livestock Corporation, the Cattle Industry, the Australian Pork Association, the Irrigators Association have all committed to net zero emissions targets. Now in their case, what they're having to do 
is their own version of what I described before on a global basis. And that is they're looking to offset their emissions from their grazing cattle by absorbing emissions by things like planting more trees on their property, possibly re, um, re, re invigorating their soil by replacing the carbon we've sucked, sucked out of that soil over the last couple of hundred years, and even um, some of the more exotic things, but even things like savanna burning, which is a common practice now, which is practiced by indigenous communities, particularly in the north, uh, part of that process. So this, this is the system that we're going to have to move to. So when I say some of these things are easy, there are things we can do today, which are relatively low cost, in some cases negative cost. And there are things which are, we know what they are, but they're still fairly expensive. So for example, manufacturing hydrogen from renewable energy is still pretty expensive. Right today, it's probably three or four, five, six times the cost of natural gas, for example. Now, um, there's a challenge there, but we know with a high degree of confidence that we can reduce, reduce the cost of hydrogen production from renewable energy. That's where the focus has to be on reducing the cost. Um, there are things which we don't quite know what we're gonna do about yet. So for example, um, steel manufacturing is relatively clear, making steel from renewable hydrogen to replace the metallurgical coal. On the other hand, cement manufacturing is really tricky because the fundamental process involves producing CO2. Uh, animal emissions, as I said, is one of the ones that still remains the most challenging. Now, you will hear people talk about, well, what about vaccines? What about uh, seaweed additives? Um, those sorts of things. I drove from Melbourne to Darwin earlier this year when I could, and um, I don't know how you get seaweed into the mouths of those cattle who are grazing in those huge cattle stations in the Northern Territory. So there are some non-trivial issues to be sought about. But most of them are at the far end of this transition over the next 30 years. So as we really start to do the things we know we can do now and relatively easily, we can then start to address by doing a lot of research development and so forth, those things are gonna be harder and more expensive. And as we do that, they'll become easier and cheaper themselves. And the last bits are gonna be about what do we do as areas where it becomes very difficult or right today sounds technically impossible because we haven't yet developed the technologies. What are we gonna do about those bits? It may very well be we end up with having to think about net zero, which means what's called removing emissions from the atmosphere. So why was, what's the obstacles to this? If it was all so dramatically important, as Mark described, and partly so affordable as I've described, what is it that's causing us to have such a difficult, why we have it, need to have this conversation here this evening? Now, one of the reasons is something which is not ideological, it's not technical, it's not economic, it's not even cultural, it's raw, naked politics. If you, if some of you might have heard a, ter a, a term that says something like, if you try to convince somebody to do something that they believe is fundamentally against their own self-interests, don't be surprised if they don't want to do it. So if you've got politicians who believe that they successfully won the last election because they didn't take, weren't taking action on climate change. They successfully, one of their reasons for political success was to get rid of the carbon tax as they labeled it. Don't be surprised if they're not gonna embrace a carbon price, carbon tax anytime soon. If they believe that the reason, one of the reasons they won the last election is because the Labor Party was unsuccessful in convincing elect electors across the country that they could deliver what Mark described as a just transition. Don't be surprised if, the, if politicians aren't interested in embracing the sort of things that Labor was talking about in 2019. So I think until, until the current prime minister believes that he can't stay in government without a climate policy, or until the current leader of the Labor Party believes he can't win the election without a clear policy, don't be surprised if we don't see a clear policy from either of them. Now, the politics in this area have changed in the last little while. Some of them are for the reasons that Mark mentioned, and some of them is because that raw naked politics have changed. So you'll have seen in the last two weeks, a number of Liberal Party backbenchers really coming out much more clearly than they ever have before and saying, we need to move to net zero. You've seen the treasurer, the treasurer who, whose boss at the time, Malcolm Turnbull, was 
the, the, la, the probably the last leader of a political party to lose his head over, uh, he lose his position, not his head literally, um, over climate change policy. Morrison does not want to be the next one. So he's going to try and he's going to have to stay there. And he's got a pragmatic National Party leader, Deputy Prime Minister, who also wants to stay in government. So I would guess, and I'll probably be wrong, <laughs> that they will do a deal between now and COP26 or between now and the next election. It won't be the deal that people who've worked in this area think is perfect. It won't be a national climate change policy of, of an emissions trading scheme or anything like that. It's more likely to be a commitment to net zero with a series of things that look as though they add up to a plan. They're already committed to taking a strategy to the COP meeting. So I think that's where those politics are leading us. Now the good news is in areas of very difficult partisan politics, it's always better and more likely to be successful if the party who's generally philosophically you would think is against it actually does it, because then it's likely to stick. When you've got the other way around, the evidence is it doesn't stick. So it would actually be better if we saw a, a liberal national coalition government introduce some sort of sensible carbon policy, because um, then it's more likely to stick. And then as we need to, we can go faster. The rest of the challenges or obstacles actually fall away quite quickly. Um, I mean, economics, the economics fundamentally favor the transition, even if you ignore, even if you ignore the consequences of a changing climate. One of the reasons that so many of our agricultural industry associations and their members have signed up for net zero by 2030 or 2040 or 2050 is because the agriculture cultural sector is the one that's most dramatically affected by a changing climate. They have already seen dramatic reductions in on-farm income, more in the north of the, of the country than the south. They have literally seen the impact of a changing climate on their businesses. They have also one of the sectors that's potentially threatened by other countries taking action against countries like us if we don't do something about it. So the economics favour this. The economics favour manufacturing steel in Australia from Australian iron ore and Australian renewable energy produced hydrogen. It's not about wishing it, wouldn't it be nice if we could have manufacturing jobs in this country? The economics favor manufacturing jobs in this country. And the other interesting one is about jobs. If you look at those critical minerals that Mark referred to, the evidence is published by the International Energy Agency only recently, so that within the next couple of decades, Australia, just from critical minerals manufacturing, could have more, twice as many exports in terms of revenue as we currently get from coal. The economics are overwhelmingly in favour of this transition. The technologies are not an obstacle. The technologies are abundant. I mean, unfortunately for me, what I do, I get all sorts of people coming to me with, I've got the technology that's going to solve them. There's not a problem with technology. There are some issues still ahead of us in bringing down the cost of some of those technologies, but technology is not a problem. And I do think there are some challenges with let's loosely call it cultural and social things. I think, you know, you look at the areas of Queensland and central New South Wales, particularly, where I don't think those workers voted against action on climate change. I think they voted against losing their jobs. That's what they voted against. And because they were not given a credible story for what the alternative could be. And just, I absolutely take on board what Mark was saying, and I'm aware of this concept, just transition. But when I go to the Hunter Valley, I am told, do not use that word. Do not, because it carries, for all the reasons Mark mentioned, the wrong connotations. For them, for those workers, the guys who wear the orange vests, they think a just transmission, transition means being out of a job and possibly getting a lowly paid job in a very different sector. However, those 100,000 people in Australia that we employ in carbon intensive manufacturing could, or carbon intensive jobs, including coal mining, could transition. If we start doing it now, while we are earning the export revenue from our coal and our gas, while we have those, uh, those economic resources, and while we have those well-trained people in those very successful communities in places like Gladstone and Newcastle and Port Kembla, that's, and in Victoria, in the in, in La Trobe Valley, in some parts of the other parts of the country, of the Victoria and the other states, now's the time to make that transition. And so finally, I've already started talking a little bit about opportunities. 
combining our mineral resources with our renewable energy resources is very unusual opportunity for this country. It's not, we're not the only country who has those opportunities. It's a comparative advantage. We have to turn it into a competitive advantage. The interesting challenge is that the nature, the scale and the speed that this has to happen means that traditional ways of doing it don't apply very well. What I mean by that is that normally governments tend to set policy and industry is supposed to go out and do stuff. Now we've seen in the COVID world that sometimes they need to, industries and government maybe have to do a bit more together, but this is a bit stronger example because what we need in this country is a level of industry policy, which is very unusual. And when we've been talking to a large industry who would normally almost run away from a partnership with government because they don't trust government and they don't want to be labeled, they don't want to be dragged down by what they see as the administrative bureaucracy of doing deals with government. They recognize that maybe in this particular transition, a real partnership between industry and government is what's necessary. Now, that's not because governments can't raise, companies can't raise money. Right now, the cost of debt has never been lower. Companies can raise money. The issue is there's a lot of risks in this transition, financial risks. And what they see is a partnership with government because it's government who sets the policy that a combination, an industrial partnership can actually spread the risk, manage the risk, reduce the risks, and that will encourage the investment that we need. And finally, I think, you know, you're going to see a lot about this in the next, in the lead up to the next election is this issue of regional and rural Australia. Because as you've seen from many of the polls, it says that the current government's in real trouble. It says Labor's in a stronger position, but that can switch very quickly as we know. And so a lot of this is going to play out in two ways, I think. One is um, this work that's going on behind the scenes and some of it now quite publicly in those seats, which look pretty safe, but maybe marginal for some um, city-based liberal politicians. And that's one of the reasons why you've seen those liberal backbenchers beginning to talk much more publicly about net zero, because they've seen the numbers, they've seen the polls, they know what their own electorate looks like. And then you've got those votes in, in regional Australia, where you em we employ so many uh, people in carbon intensive jobs. The farming community is not really a problem. The farming community wants to be on board with this. They know what the impact is and they know what the opportunities are. So I think Christian, I might leave it there. Thanks very much, Tony. So we should show our appreciation. I encourage everyone to do. Um, I'm gonna put my uh, screen on gallery view now. I encourage those of you out there to do so as well. Um, so thanks very much to both, both speakers. There's certainly a lot to, to take in. And as speaking as someone who's not across all that, um, I certainly needed quite a bit of time to digest everything. But I, I noticed there, there was a little bit coming through uh, on the chat. And I do now encourage people to um, register their wish to ask questions or um, to have a bit of more discussion. And to do that, I recommend that you uh, use the raise hand function, which I should be able to see. There were a couple of questions on chat though as well. But just as I get to them, I see Michael Rizzo has um, his hand up. Do you want to have the floor, Michael, and ask the first question? Yeah, thanks, Christian. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, Christian. Look, um, Mark would know this, but uh, I just recently retired from the union movement and I worked for nearly 30 years with the... Um, uh, with the ASU and uh, therefore with the electricity workers. And so I was really coming to this from a point of view, from the union point of view and from a worker's point of view. Um, I experienced the, the terrible privatisation of the Fro Valley um, in the 1990s and the devastating, devastating effect that that had on, the, on that community. Massive unemployment, domestic violence went through the roof, um, people uh, going into casual, less paid jobs, etc. And I've also visited the Hunter Valley in Queensland, et cetera. And so um, while I do believe in just transition, obviously, and uh, but you will find resistance for the very points that Tony and, and Mark made, and that is that a lot of these people have got very well-paid jobs between about $100,000 and $200,000 a year, which are fairly secure. 
And then all of a sudden, when those power stations shut down, those jobs are not replicated in those numbers and they're not as well paid or as secure. And it's not just those five or 700 people who work for the power stations. It's all, it's all the local businesses, the small businesses as well, that are impacted about the loss of income in that community as well. So in the 90s, there's all these four lease signs in every second shop in Morwell and, and Maui. So um, the secret lies in the just, just transition in, in you know, giving people notice and giving people time to, um, to adopt and to change. As Mark says, that usually people give you, you know, four or five months notice, which is just nonsense. You can't do things in four or five months. Um, so that's why we get the resistance from the Latrobe Valley, from the Hunter Valley, from the Queensland mines. As Tony, I think, said, people are not necessarily opposed to climate change or deny climate change. It's that it really impacts them directly and their community directly, and it devastates their community within a couple of years, really quickly. And I saw this with my own eyes on the Troy Valley in the 1990s, and it's terrible. Virtually seeing grown men cry um, because they don't know what to do with themselves. They become unemployed, they become unemployable, their skills are not transferable, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I was just wondering if the speakers um, can address this fundamental issue that the opposition lies not so much in that they oppose climate change, but I think, as Mark said, that they oppose losing their jobs and not being provided with you know an alternative job which is comparable. I'm gonna kick off Tony. I think I think people um, and if you excuse the term, most Australians have pretty good bullshit meters. And if you start promising them a just transition, they don't believe you, if they think you're pushing it uphill, they don't, they're pushing it uphill with them, they don't believe you, right? Mm. Because, you know, I think what I've seen, Michael, when I've been to the Hunter region several, many times actually, <laughs> until quite recently in the last couple of years, talking about this stuff with those communities, and equally in Gladstone, they don't deny this is happening. What they do want to do is be part of it, but they don't know what to do. Um, so not surprising, they, they, the, their, their, their conclusion is, is, as you said, what I've seen starting to happen, and as I said, this is not, there's no point in doing this five months out. This is, we're now talking, hopefully, a couple of decades out. And the conversation that, that I've been part of, uh, more so in the Hunter, I suspect, than the others, is around right now, <coughs> we've got well paid jobs, we've got people who have got families. We've got communities in those areas which are reason, reasonably, I mean, not overly prosperous, but reasonably stable. Leaving it until people start leaving in droves is not a good idea. So now's the time to do it. And we're starting to see that. Now, I know it didn't solve everything, but if you, if the sort of limited research I've done into what happened in Newcastle after the BHP largely shut down a lot of its manufacturing in the steel industry uh, was pretty bad. But it survived, and in fact, in some cases, it thrived. And one of the part, one of the issues was the partnership that was established um, between the federal government, the state government, the local government, the universities, the TAFE colleges, BHP, and the unions. All of those, as far as I'm told, were part of that story. That doesn't mean that people didn't lose their jobs. Some people lost their jobs and probably never walked, worked again. But that was going to happen anyway. So you can't protect people from what's going to happen. We know what's going to happen. The coal industry is going to shut down. <laughs> you cannot stop that. It's like trying to stop, you know, telling Kodak, well, we're going to, Kodak's saying we're going to keep making film. It doesn't work. Now, it may happen more slowly. It may happen more quickly. That's the bit we don't really know. So if we start working today, and it is beginning, Michael, it's not perfect. There are the green shoots already. If we start working on these things now, where are these industries? What industries are they going to be? How are we going to develop green steel? How are we going to make lithium in Australia? Then we've got some chance. And then we might start to see a transition which actually which brings those workers with us. And I think that's where the opportunity lies. And I think that's where we've got some possibility of achieving the outcome because other, anything else just will be worse. And if we, by the way, if we start and it turns out that um, we need to go slower, we can go slower, we can go slower. And if it turns out we need to go fast, we can go faster. But if we don't start, 
we'll never get there. We'll, and we'll certainly end up with the sort of problem you have witnessed personally in the Latrobe Valley. Mark, did you want to add anything to that? Look, I think that was pretty comprehensive. I, I, I maybe I'll just add two very quick um, rejoinders to that. I mean, um, it's important that we don't, that communities and workers are not left behind. But if we plan for it properly, we can get that right. We, we know where the people are. We know what the horizon, time horizon is. We can get that right. So I don't think we should be overly focused on the downside, but you do need some government leadership and you need investment to diversify those regional economies and you need policy, which is gonna get new industries established in those regions. So that's the thing that we're really missing, you know, and that's why it seems so much harder than it really is in Australia, because we're just not getting that net level of leadership. Um, and, and, you know, just one other comment, um, you know, coal mine workers can't see themselves working on a solar farm, can't see themselves operating a wind farm. I, you know, I've had the conversations with them. They can, however, potentially see themselves operating in a green steel industry. Um, and gas workers can see themselves operating in a hydrogen industry. It's kind of similar skills, similar type jobs. And so, you know, if we, if we get on the front foot and grow these industries quickly, that can be part of the transition plan, these, these new industries. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm taking my own list. So I'm gonna go to a couple of the questions that have appeared on the chat. And I might invite the people who, who wrote them to ask the question. Jim Crosthwaite, at, um, a, a bit earlier on, about half an hour ago, you posed a question about um, just transition for gas workers. Do you, wanna, do you wanna air that question here now to the speakers? Yes, I started reading and writing about this a couple of years ago. Um, the gas industry workers are more than what Mark just said. They span uh, people who work for Ream making gas stoves. Uh, they, they're the people who come to our houses and repair the hot water service. Um, they span a whole, whole span, a whole, you know, there's a whole complex that's much more uh, difficult in some respects than, than for coal. I'm not trying to say coal is easy at all when I say that. So I'd be interested in comments on that, but I do want to highlight something else, which is about the Vic and leadership. The Victorian government is moving to lead on gas. In our houses, we consume far more gas, Australian gas domestically than any other usage in warming our houses, basically. The Victorian government has initiated a process where where the, uh, the gas substitution roadmap, which is looking to get off gas by 2050. Um, I've got a whole lot of issues around the process and that, but I think what's happening with gas in Victoria is a really exciting place to be, but there's a hell of a lot of struggles going on behind the scenes as well. And perhaps Mark and uh, Tony would like to comment on that as well. Yeah, you, I mean, you're right, and there are a, a real, range of jobs in the industry but some of them you know plumbers that do gas generally do other types of plumbing as well um, you know companies that make uh, gas water heaters generally also make solar water heaters and there's a lot of appliances there's actually a lot of work in the electrification of all of the appliances that we use gas for in residentially and there's also a lot of work um, in industrial gas use and gas used for heat to um, you know, upgrade boilers or electrify boilers. So it's it it, it comes back to having a, a a plan and a roadmap of where you want to go. And that's why, as you say, the Victorian government's work is quite important. And, and getting on with it and doing the as Tony says, doing the easy stuff um, to to begin with. And you know, if there's something that's really hard, if there's a particular industrial process that it's very hard to move away from gas from, well, perhaps that's the last thing that you're using gas for in, you know, 10, 20, maybe even 30 years. Um, so I, I think, you know, we're, I, I think we can find our way um, through these issues. I mean, the other thing to think about with gas is that um, we consume, Tony might have the exact figure, but we consume about 10% of the gas we dig up in Australia 
in Australia and we export 80 to 90 percent of it. Um, so actually the emissions problem with gas is largely through the gas that we're exporting to other nations. Yeah, look, I think um, that's that's right. In fact, interestingly, one of the big sources of emissions re increasing in Australia in the last five years has been the emissions that occur during the extraction of the gas and the liquefaction, liquefaction of that gas to LNG before it's exported overseas. And those emissions occur in Australia and they're huge, millions of tonnes a year. And so, you know, that's been a, one of the challenges we have. Um, and right now, I'm sure many of you would be aware that there's actually a, a global shortage of gas at the moment. Um, uh, that's causing some people to say, well, we shouldn't have gone to renewables and some people who say we should have gone to renewables faster. Look, in terms of, Jim, I, my, my dirty secret is that I spent the first half of my life, um, working life anyway, in the gas industry and, um, you know, used to run cooking schools in Brisbane um, for people to try and convince them they should use gas rather than electricity and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> um, the thing about gas that I find quite intriguing is that many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the current prime minister taking a lump of coal into parliament. And it, a bit like what you were suggesting is that we tend to, it's easy to demonize coal because it's this out there. I mean, most of us, I don't think, any, I don't know if anybody on this um, webinar this evening actually burns coal in their homes to keep themselves warm, but Victorians used to. Many, many, some of you may live in houses that do have the old coal fired coal fireplaces still. Now, we changed and we'll change again. Uh, the challenge is that gas is much closer to us because we're the ones who are burning the gas in our homes. We are the coal fired power station. We can't blame somebody else in a sense. So that's for us and certainly for someone like myself who grew up in the gas industry and ran the argument for quite a while that gas is cleaner. Gas is part of the solution. What we didn't appreciate is how quickly it has become part of the problem. So two things. Firstly, um, again, like most things in life is to say, okay, let's stop pretending the world's gonna be otherwise. In my view, there is no doubt that in 2050, we won't be getting gas anymore. Now, the only place I think we might, we may, and I think it's unlikely because I think we'll find other solutions. We may need some gas to back up wind and solar under some very difficult circumstances. It's nothing to do with um, really nasty uh, heat waves in summer. That's easily fixed with batteries and transmission. It's due to do with long winter periods, shorter days, more need for heating, and the wind stops blowing across the whole bloody east coast of Australia. It happens. It's just happened in the northern in the northern hemisphere as well. And so it may be when you do the numbers, we need something. What's called deep storage. Now, whether that's having enough gas around, or whether it's hydrogen or whatever, remains to be seen. So gas could play a role, but everything else is solvable. 30 years is plenty of time to sort out how we're going to replace natural gas with hydrogen as a feedstock, how we're going to replace gas in the network. The network one is tricky for Victoria for the reasons you mentioned. The transition is going to be challenging because um, for most of us on this call tonight, it would be cheaper to go all electric than to have gas. Cheaper. Induction cooktops work just fine. They're cheaper than they used to be. Uh, heat pumps for heating hot water work just fine. They're all, that's all. That's not a problem. The changeover costs are significant. So what we need is a go government to recognise where we're going to go and start the plan. The changeover costs for all those um, households and the changeover costs for that network because not only are the, all those workers in that industry, Jim, but there's also all the, um, uh, the, the investment in those networks. And so are we going to convert that to hydrogen or are we going to basically shut it down and go to electricity? My suspicion is the latter is more likely, but I was involved in taking the last project in this country to take hydrogen out of the gas network was one that I was responsible for. I'm not about to, I find it difficult to think we're going to put gas hydrogen back into a gas network. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. I'm keen. I know, uh, Lynette Saville, you, you had a question on the chat and I, I think this might just be, um, be our last question. I'm, I'm sorry, Iran, I see you do have your hand up, but we are quickly running out of time. So Lynette, do you want to pose your question to the speakers? I'm not sure if Lynette's there or if she's muted. 
I'm looking around. I can't see her. Um, Iran, I'm, I, I, I can't see Lynette. So Iran, I'm happy to give you the final question here. Um, do you want to? Do you want to have a go? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Christian. Um, uh, Tony and Mark, um, look. During the pandemic, uh, Australia shut its borders overnight in response to a crisis, uh, and it shut down in the process our third biggest export industry, which is international education. And as a result, we lost tens of thousands of jobs from the tourism industry. We lost uh, between 16 and 25% of staff in our universities within the first year. So I'm just wondering in that context, if you can comment on why coal sector jobs would loom so largely over this debate in relation to climate change. And also in terms of the quite radical and fast changes we've seen in Australia over the past two years, uh, why are we talking about slow transitions over 10 and 20 years rather than much faster ones, which, which may be possible, even if politically very difficult? Great question. Thanks, Aaron. Um, yeah, we've lost 20, 22,000 jobs in the tertiary sector, um, many more than that in tourism, which will hopefully come back. But the ones in tertiary education, they're, they're redundancy. It's, you know, they're... they're people who won't be going back to campus. Um, so you're right, we, have, we seem to, you know, valorise certain industries, but not others. I think there's a few reasons for that. I think, you know, we've talked about the, the, um, the uh, secure, well-paid nature of some of those jobs. They're often quite concentrated. So you'll get, you know, hundreds or in some cases, thousands of workers, miners or power station workers in a particular electorate. So they have a bit of electoral clout, you know, I think there's also the fact that it it conveniently aligns with the delay agenda of some governments um, to choose to focus on those jobs. But the reality is, you know, I, I talked about 12 coal-fired power stations closing in the last eight years. Most of them happened under a coalition government. And same story in the US, you know, um, Donald Trump talked about saving coal um, but more coal jobs were lost in the US under the Trump period of government than under eight years of Barack Obama's government. So, you know, these, these, are, these are changes that are happening very rapidly and we better, we're best off getting out in front of them. Um, I, I would hate to think that what I was talking about was arguing for moving slowly. Um, you know, I, I think we need to move very quickly, um, but I do think that halving emissions in the next nine years is very difficult. You know, it's decarbonizing at a rate that we've never done before. You're right, COVID has opened our eyes to all sorts of new opportunities. One, one opportunity that we've really missed is that a huge proportion of our recovery expenditure is actually making the problem, solving the problem of climate change harder with the investment in opening up gas fields, um, gas exploration that's been posed in the questions. Whereas other countries like um, Germany and the UK have been spending up to 60% of their COVID recovery investment has also been aligned with tackling climate change, which is how they've managed to increase their national commitments um, to, the, to the point where the UK's emissions target is 68% by 2030, which is, is a really, strong target um, yeah so so hopefully we can build back better um, we can um, we can look after the industries that have really struggled and rebuild them um, but also concentrate on the industries of the future I think the only things I'd add to that would be um, you know I think the reason Aaron for the focus on coal jobs is is a political one again um, you, know, you don't see people, I don't, it's not obvious to me yet that it, the voters are going to take out their frustrations on any particular political party at any particular election. I mean, it may happen. I mean, I suspect uh, what happened, there's, there, for me, there's two big issues. I mean, the, the world could go to hell in a handbasket. China could do whatever. But I mean, the, the two issues that are going to be most relevant, I think, to what happens towards the next election. And that, what's, that's what gets people, that's, the thing that keeps politicians going is the next election, right? I mean, they'll use all the other stuff we've been talking about, but that's what they're interested in. 
And so the thing that's going to affect this, I think, is two. And one of them is the one we've been talking about this evening, and the other one is the one you mentioned, Aaron, the pandemic. So what happens with this vaccination rollout and the opening of our cities and our communities again, if this goes badly, it'll be interesting to see who gets the blame, because the, the first cab off the rank electorally is going to be the Commonwealth. I suspect now, you know, they're not going to, I don't think they're going to go in November. I suspect it's probably more likely March and possibly May. So, you know, what happens if that, that's going to, I think, have an enormous impact and it will be, I, I wouldn't even attempt to predict how much blame they'll put on the Morrison government for that. But it, that's the thing that drives him. That's what drives him. And the other one is what happens with this summer. It turns out that we're not, it's that all the long term weather forecasts suggest that we're more likely to have a, a cooler and wetter summer than a hotter and drier summer. We had a relatively cooler and wetter summer for 2020-2021, and much com by comparison with the summer of 2019-20, the Northern Hemisphere just had a hell, of a, a hell of a summer, right? So if we had a hell of a summer and things went badly, you can forget about Morris and he's gone completely. It's possible he could come back in those other areas. That's what the cold job is about politics. They are concentrated in certain areas. If you look at those 100,000 workers in carbon intensive jobs, they're in central Queensland, the Hunter Valley, the, um, the, the uh, Illawarra district of New South Wales, some parts of South Australia and some parts of Victoria. And there were swings towards the coalition on those, in those areas, right? That's what that was about, politics. And you see what happened with the Labor Party and Joel Fitzgibbon, right? He had a huge swing against him and that, you saw how badly that's played out. So it's about politics. The other bit is, and, but I think again, that I don't know that the politics of the pandemic are gonna play out the same way. The other side of it, of course, is that this is a very unusual sort. You look at all the other recessions we've had in this country in the last hundred years. Most of them have been caused by things which are not, not like they're not caused by us doing stuff to ourselves. In a sense, we didn't decide deliberately to do most of them. This one, we decided we had to do something to respond to this pandemic, and that's what's caused the recession. It also means the recovery could be very different. And so, you know, as Mark said, some of those areas are going to recover quite quickly. Some of them, who knows? I mean, how yeah, some of the sectors. Many of you, I'm sure, have friends and, and colleagues who work in the education sector, who work in the entertainment sector. They're gonna, they're, they've are going they had it really tough and how, how quickly they can return remains to be seen. Um, in terms of faster, look, I think the, I think the recovery, <laughs> we'll see, but I mean, it seems like most likely recovery from the, the COVID pandemic will be quite fast. Why can't we do it faster in the energy transition? Part of it is... There's a, lot of, there's a lot of kit to replace if we're going to do this, what has to be done. The worst thing that could happen is if we stuff it up in the process. If we were to, you know, as, as the coal-fired power stations close, as they will, if we don't replace that with the right combination of wind, solar, batteries, pumped hydro and transmission to, to balance the system, then we will have a bigger problem because it'll reverberate very badly. And there's, when you think about how much it has to be built, in a very short space of time. in 30 years is for that to be done. This is a system that's taken us 120 years to get us where we are now. And we're going to fundamentally change it in 30 years. That requires a huge amount of investment. We know how badly we generally are at making these big investments. The chances of getting it right and not having huge over expenditure are not very good. Look what's happened with um, you know, the, the, tra the transport infrastructure that's being built at the moment, for example. Um, and the, 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 uh, the issues that Mark referred to in many of the cases these assets are going to be built in areas where there will be community pushback of the infrastructure that's being built in their community so i think there, this, there does need to be a very commit a strong commitment a strong partnership between government industry and unions to get this to work and it's got to engage the communities as well and that will take more time than many of us would prefer Thanks very much, Tony, and, and thanks very much to you, Mark. I think we might wrap it up there. We are a, a few minutes over, that's, that's okay. I, I thank everyone for bearing with us. Um, could, I, could you join me in thanking both our speakers very much for their time this evening? And I'll just um, remind you um, that, uh, look, I am sorry, I do know there were other questions and I'm going to record I've recorded them in my notebook for next week, which is what I'd like to now uh, remind you all about. So obviously at, at Conversation at the Crossroads, we emphasise the importance of the ongoing conversation. And we're going to be putting together a little bit of a refresher pack with some links and other materials and resources. 
which we're going to email to all the registrants on Monday. I know, Alex, you'll be working hard on, on some of that stuff. This will be to help jog your memory, memory about what's been spoken about this evening and to get you thinking about what you've heard. And so I'd, I'd, I'd like to suggest that you let this percolate. You perhaps have a little look at the, what, we, what we send out um, and we come back next week and after we've had time to digest it, perhaps put our own uh, thinking caps on, we come prepared to kind of workshop shop a few ideas and, um, and, and think about the sort that, um, that this presents and um, drawing very much on what we've heard. Um, we will, sorry, sorry, my internet's a little unstable, folks, but we will put together a few clips, a little just grabs from tonight's event just to jog your memories next week. Um, and I, again, thank all, all of you for attending, both our speakers and those. I want to also earn my thanks to the Conversate Roads team for all their hard work to Susan for her technical support and to the, especially to the E-team of Erin, Manu and Elliot for getting the message out. They did a fabulous job. And, um, and thanks to everyone else for all their tireless work with the uh, spreading of the message as well. And so I look forward to seeing many of you back at the same time at the same link next week for a little bit more ongoing discussion and conversation. Other than that, I wish you all a um, very good evening. Thanks, everybody.